thanks to everybody for coming. And I and I hope that this conversation leads you all to go back through the lives and works of all these people who we'll be covering. Um, obviously, you know, for me as a Pan-Africanist, being an Nkrumah, um, there's so much more to the work that he was doing and the, and the life that he was attempting to live. And so I just hope that people will continue to engage these things, not as individuals, in groups with people, have these conversations about the text and how it speaks to us differently now. So I encourage that for everybody. So by way of introduction, in terms of what makes conscientism a classic text and also why of all of the sort of books that Layla mentioned, why I'd focus on this one other than the fact that it was published by Monthly Review. So the first, I think the first thing to state is that we need to take Africans' ideas seriously as ideas, as philosophy. What, um, so there's a philosopher named Lewis Gordon who speaks about the ways that we often reduce African people to biography or to action, right? So to the, to the level of embodiment. We don't take them seriously as knowledge producers and as people who, whose ideas are worthy of thought on the one hand and original on the other. If it is that we do take up their ideas, we take them up as the deriv derivative of Western thought or Western philosophy or Western ideas. And so first and foremost, we just need to take Nkrumah seriously, not only as a statesman, not only as a revolutionary and Pan-Africanist, those things are absolutely important, but also as a philosopher, also as a producer of knowledge. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that conscientism is probably the most overlooked or understudied aspects of Nkrumah's works, not least because he was not necessarily taken seriously as a philosopher. Another reason is that Similar to sort of somebody like W.E.B. Du Bois or Oliver Cromwell Cox, what can happen is that the, when African thinkers stretch Marxism, so, you know, Fanon talked about that when it comes to the colonial situation, Marxism needs to be stretched. When it is that Black folks or African folks stretch, stretch Marxism, their works can be erased or disregarded as not really Marxist or as doing Marxism wrong, right? Doing scientific socialism wrong, as opposed to um, understanding that these thinkers are articulating Marxism or scientific socialism to their, their, to their historical and material conditions. And so I'm just going to read um, an excerpt from Walter Rodney from a, from a piece called Marxism and African Liberation, where he offers an engagement or an assessment of um, Nkrumah's thought from um, conscientism to Nkrumism and his own perspective about what Nkrumah um, got wrong in this particular text. And so let me, let me just um, go ahead and read this. And this is from 1975, um, words of Walter Rodney. So he said, Nkrumah spent a number of years during the 50s and right up to when he was overthrown, which 1966, um, that would cover at least 10 years in which he was searching for an ideology. He started out with the mixture of Marxism and Protestantism. He talked about Pan-Africanism. He went to conscientism, then Nkrumahism, and, and there was everything other than a straight understanding of socialism. What were the actual consequences of this perception? That is what matters to us. Let us assume that he was searching for something African and that he was trying to avoid the trap of adopting something alien. What were the practical consequences of this attempt to dissociate himself from an international socialist tradition? We saw in Ghana that Nkrumah steadfastly refused to accept that there were classes, but that there were class contradictions in Ghana and um, these class contradictions were fundamental. For years, Nkrumah went along with this mishmash of philosophy, which took some socialist premises, but which he refused to pursue to their logical conclusion. Uh, that one um, that one either had a capitalist system based upon the private ownership of the means of production and the alienation of the product of people's labor, or one had an alternative system which was completely different and that there was no way of juxtaposing and mixing these two to create anything that was new and viable. A most significant test of this position was when Nkrumah himself was overthrown. After he was overthrown, he lived in Guinea Conakry, and before he died, he wrote a small text called Class Struggle in Africa. It is not the greatest philosophical treatise, but it is historically important because it is there Nkrumah has himself, in effect, admits the consequences, um, the misleading consequences of an ideology which espoused an African cause, but which felt, for reasons which he did not understand, a historical necessity to separate itself from scientific socialism. 
And so this critique is particularly an interesting um, entry point into um, conscientism. It does actually explain the way that Nkrumah is trying to grapple with the relationship between materialism and idealism. Even as he asserts uh, materialist philosophy as primary, there still is a way that he is, based on his understanding of the constitution of African society, there is a way that he is not trying to argue for um, materialism as the only um, the only philosophy that matters, even as it's primary. And so on Walter Rodney's assessment, that was a fallacy, right? That created a fundamental understanding of, of the possibilities of, so, uh, of socialism in Africa, but also um, a, a fallacy in his analysis. But nonetheless, what's really important is that Walter Rodney is taking Nkrumah seriously as a thinker, and he's acknowledging how Nkrumah's historical reality and material reality presented to him with a problem that he's trying to resolve. And that over time, Nkrumah is evolving in his thinking about capitalism, about imperialism, and about the nature of class conflict and class contradiction um, in Africa. So um, that's the second reason why um, conscientism is important. The third reason is what we might call um, a philosophy born of struggle. So I just want to read a couple things um, from Leonard Harris. So Leonard Harris is an African-American philosopher who kind of coins this, this idea of philosophy born of struggle. And what he says um, is that um, philosophic texts, if products of social groups doggedly fighting to survive, are texts born of struggle. They must cut through the jungle of oppressive deeds to the accompanying lab labyrinth of words masking the nature of the deeds. Brought with controversial institutions that reflect the coming um, accepted beliefs of the new world, such texts challenge prevailing ways of viewing the world. And so we can argue that that's precisely what um, conscientism does, right? And so part of what Nkrumah argues, Layla will cover this more, but part of what he argues is that colonized folks don't have the luxury of ideas for ideas sake, right? Philosophy has to have an applied, it has to be applied to the purpose of liberation. And that is what he um, and Kruma is grappling with, with respect to conscientism. Um, a second rendering of this idea of philosophy born of struggle is that, so Leonard writes that I contend as a normative claim that genuine philosophy is philosophy as and sourced by strife, tenaciousness, organism striving, um, as a result of intellectual struggle with, with real corporal existence, and it's always inclusive of undue duress. It is sentient beings that can be afflicted and thereby no concept of form, dialectic, rationality, phenomenology, sagacious insight, confessions, testimonial, or witnessing is warranted without the express inclusion of the afflicted seen as such. And so again, this applies to um, conscientism as a philosophy because it is specifically about how Africans ought to go about understanding the world in ways that undergird their struggle. And Africans who, as um, a historical and material reality, have been subjected to colonialism, imperialism, as well as endogenous forms of conflict derived from the system of capitalism. So um, those are three of the reasons why con uh, conscientism is important. So I'll hand it back to Layla here. I want to play a brief clip. So this clip is actually a clip of Amilcar Cabral speaking on the occasion of, of Nkrumah's death in Guinea. The speech is called The Cancer of Betrayal. Trois dire encore, mais nous devons parler, car sinon, à ce moment, si nous ne parlons pas, le cœur peut éclater. Le président Gruma, auquel nous rendons hommage, c'est d'abord le stratège génial de la lutte contre le colonialisme classique, celui qui a créé ce que nous pouvons appeler le positivisme africain, auquel il a appelé le positive action, l'action positive. Nous rendons hommage à l'ennemi déclaré du néocolonialisme en Afrique et ailleurs, au stratège du développement économique de son pays. Monsieur le Président, nous saluons le combattant de la liberté des peuples d'Afrique, qui a toujours su accorder un appui sans réserve au mouvement de libération nationale. Et nous voulons vous dire ici que nous, en Guinée aux îles du Cap Vert, s'il est vrai que le facteur primordial pour le développement de notre lutte, 
à l'extérieur de notre pays a été l'indépendance de la République de Guinée, le nom héroïque du peuple guinéen le 28 septembre 1958, il est vrai aussi que si nous sommes partis vers la lutte encouragée, cela a été beaucoup dû à l'appui concret du Ghana et particulièrement du président Gourma. Monsieur le Président, nous devons cependant à ce moment nous rappeler que toutes les monnaies dans la vie ont deux faces. Toutes les réalités ont des aspects positifs et négatifs. À l'action positive, c'est opposé et s'oppose toujours une action négative et vice-versa. Jusqu'à quel point donc le succès de la trahison au Ghana est-il lié ou non lié à des problèmes de la lutte de classe, des contradictions de structure sociale, du rôle du parti et d'autres institutions, y compris des forces armées dans le cadre de la nouvelle État indépendant Jusqu'à quel point, demandons-nous à nous-mêmes, le succès de la trahison au Ghana est-il ou non lié à une définition correcte de cette entité historique et artisan de l'histoire qu'est le peuple et à son action quotidienne en défense de ses propres conquêtes dans l'indépendance Ou jusqu'à quel point le succès de la trahison n'est-il pas lié au problème majeur du choix des hommes dans la Révolution Méditer sur cette quelque question nous permettra peut-être de mieux comprendre la grandeur de l'œuvre de Nkrumah, de comprendre la complexité des problèmes qu'il a dû affronter combien de fois seul. Des problèmes qui nous permettront sûrement de conclure que tant que l'impérialisme existe, un État indépendant en Afrique doit être un mouvement de libération au pouvoir ou il n'en sera pas. Qu'on ne vienne pas nous affirmer que Nkrumah est mort à cause d'un cancer de la gorge ou d'autres quelconques maladies. Non, Nkrumah a été tué par le cancer de la trahison que nous devons extirper. Par le cancer de la trahison dont nous devons extirper les racines en Afrique si nous voulons vraiment, vraiment liquider définitivement la domination impérialiste sur ce continent. Mais nous, Africains, nous croyons fermement que les morts continuent vivants à nos côtés. Nous sommes des sociétés de morts et de vivants. Nkrumah ressuscitera chaque aube dans le cœur et dans la détermination des combattants de la liberté, dans l'action de tous les véritables patriotes africains. Nous, mouvement de la libération, nous ne pardonnerons pas ceux qui ont trahi Nkrumah. Le peuple du Ghana ne pardonnera pas. L'Afrique ne pardonnera pas. L'humanité progressiste ne pardonnera pas. So what I want to offer by way of an intervention, one of the questions that came up for us as we were planning the seminar was how how is conscientious how is conscientism or conscientism relevant? How does it what kind of work does it do for us across time, across space, across generations? And so for me, um, as a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party GC, and not just as a and and also having been raised in that tradition, um, I want to share some of what the party calls its own ideology. And so I'm going to share that page. We cannot overstate the importance of revolutionary ideology. And Krumism Terrorism takes its name from the consistent revolutionary scientific socialist and pan Africanist principles, practices, and policies followed, implemented, and taught by Kwame Nkrumah, Amiseko Ture, and Kwame Ture, three of the foremost exponents and practitioners of the scientific strategy to liberate and unify Africa and all African people in every corner of the world under scientific socialism. These principles, practices, and practices are recorded in their speeches, writings, actions, contributions, achievements, and lives. That 
it must be read, studied, analyzed, and implemented. And for me, um, this is a part of that work to be having this conversation today. Um, in a larger, more complete sense, incrementalism and Toryism is a product of Africa's history and culture, accumulated practical and theoretical contributions and achievements of centuries of generations of mass revolutionary Pan-African and larger socialist struggles. Incrementalism and Toryism is a way of life. It directs its, its adherence to place the need of the people over money and material wealth and establishes revolutionary ethics and morality for how we engage each other and fight the enemy in the African Revolution. It highlights and underscores the need for the absolute emancipation of African women as African women have suffered triple oppression politically, economically, and by men imbued by and with the sexist ideology of capitalism. Incrementalism to raise and provides the masses of people, uh, masses of African people with a set of uncompromising principles, a scientific, revolutionary, and Pan-African method of viewing the world, and as a scientific methodology and set of analytical tools which enable African people to correctly interpret, understand, redeem, and reconstruct Africa, and to make their revolutionary contribution to the redemption and reconstruction of the oppressed world. A couple of questions are raised by this, right? One is, Mo most of um, conscientism is going through Western philosophy, which begs the question, why, right? If this is about a sort of endogenous or um, autochthonous form of African struggle, why we focus on all these white folks, right? Because the only people who are named with the exception of one philosopher, Amo, they're all white, right? And so, We'll get to this. The second question is, we identify as um, Nkrumah Tereus or Nkrumah, but not um, conscientious. Why, right? So these are just two questions that arose um, as, as we were going through the text. But what we wanna do now is not give a sort of a overarching or comprehensive summary of the text, but rather what are some of the takeaways from each chapter? So Layla, we'll start with um, the introduction. So to that point, to that point that um, Sharice just made about um, why why is Nkrumah in conversation with so many white thinkers? So obviously we have we have varying views on this, but one of my personal takeaways from this is that is that it is it it is in fact his material reality, right? So one of the ways that I read this is that as a as a person who grew up in colonial Ghana, um, and obviously Ghana was ruled by the British, the education system that was in place there um, was obviously a British colonial education and continued to be so for, for a while. Um, you know, and if we look at places like the Congo, right, when, when Lumumba came to power in the Congo, I think there were, what, less than 20 people who had the who even had a colonial education to be determined to be able to do um, the work of leading the country. And so one of the things that Nkrumah highlights um, in the introduction is he talks about the predicament of the colonial student, which he understands himself to be. Um, so on page three, he says, a colonial student does not by origin belong to the intellectual history in which the university philosophers are such impressive landmarks. The colonial student can be so seduced by these attempts to give a philosophical account of the universe that he surrenders his whole personality to them. When he does this, he loses sight of the fundamental social fact that he is a colonial subject. In this way, he omits to draw from his education and from the concern displayed by the great philosophers for human problems. Anything which he might relate to the very real problems of colonial domination, which as it happens, conditions the immediate life of every colonized African. And so um, I guess maybe we'll have a little bit of back and forth here about this, but I think there, there are legitimate questions to be asked about why all of the um, philosophers, the, the, why the bulk of the philosophers that in, in Kruma engages in the text are Western European philosophers. And, and again, I, I read that as a product of his material conditions, right? So we haven't been a colonial student, having then Thinking of thinking of the U.S. as outside of the kind of um, typical or classic kind of colonial conscriptions that the, the rest of Western Europe is a part of, he goes there for an education in philosophy, which then sort of still reinscribes his kind of Western Eurocentric um, uh, engagements with the philosophical thinkers. So then he's now thinking through um, these these philosophers that he's learned or been in conversation with to think about what it means for the explicit um, future of Africa. And so, I, you know, I, I see that 
both in himself, I see him reading that predicament in himself and in and across the continent of Africa. And so I, I'll say more, but I'll let CBS weigh in. Mm. I just know that at this time you have people, for example, like John Henry Clark, who are recovering the thought of the Akan philosophical tradition, um, the Egyptian philosophical tradition, right? And the thing is, Nkrumah offers a critique of um, idealist philosophy, but he's not offering a critique of Western philosophy as such, right? And so I think that the sort of the broader point is that there is not a in a, in the colonial situation, right? In a in a colonized world, there's not an easy bifurcation of Afro, African centered and Eurocentrism. That because of the nature, because of the the sort of found the the sociology of knowledge, right, is um, still dominated by by European thought. The question is, does one go through it? Right, or does one ground the project altogether in alternative philosophical traditions, which exist and which were available at the time? Because this is the 1960s, right? Um, now, granted, I'm also, I don't think I'm extrapolating into the past, but I'm also, I have the conceit of Black studies training where, like, I don't feel the need, um, the epistemological need, but I, um, nor the sort of material need to go through those Western philosophers because there's such a there's much more sort of intellectual resources that are rooted in um, that we have access to right now and so um, I don't know but I, I mean I, I unite with what <laughs> Layla is saying but it's like there's no you're not even gonna name your contemporaries like there's no black people named in this text but Amo you know and so it just it's it. Mm, is giving Eurocentrism, but I but I let it rock. And I mean, and so in the in part of the conversation that we've had back and forth about this is that it it is it can give that and also be and also do the work that he's attempting to do, right? Because what I also read is that what he's saying about um, idealism and the and the particular Western philosophers that he engages is that the the schools of thought that they choose to engage were based in the particular material realities and the social questions that they had to answer and so that that's partially how I read that and I, I mean and I think that the the questions that you ask you know are legitimate real questions I also think that like you said some of it is for me some of it is the product of the time all right so chapter one so this is where he really like runs it, right? This is where he goes through many of the idealist and materialist philosophical thinkers from Thales to um, uh, Descartes, et cetera. I'm not gonna run through that history, but the overarching point of this chapter is to assert the primacy of philosophical materialism generally and dialectical materialism particularly over philosophical idealism as the basis of, to argue for the primacy of matter, not the sole existence of matter, right? But the primacy of matter um, over perception. And so this has implications for his late, later on for um, his understanding of egalitarianism and egalitarianism as only possible or emanating from materialist philosophy, right? And so um, there's a quote that I wanna read um, that I feel like sums up sort of what the purpose of this chapter is. And so he writes, um, I have to, I have to, sorry, I'm trying to take this bookmark off. I have suggested that dialect, uh, that dialectic is that which makes the evolution of kinds possible, that accordingly, which is the grounds of the evolution of mind from matter, of quality from quantity, of energy from mass. This kind of emergence, since it depends on a critical organization of matter, truly represents a leap. When a crisis results in an advance, it is, um, it is, its nature to, to perpetuate a leap. The solution of a crisis always represents a discontinuity. And just as in the foundations of mathematics, critical numbers represent a break in continuity in the evolution of numbers, so in nature does the emergence of quality from quantity represent a break in the continuity of a quantitative process. He goes on to say, it's important that dialectical evolution be not conceived as linear, um, continuous and monodirect, uh, monodirectional. Evolution so conceived has no explanation to offer. 
Um, he says, um, linear evolution is incompatible with the evolution of kinds because the evolution of kinds represents a linear discontinuity. In dialectical evolution, progress is not linear. It is, um, it is so to say, from one plane to another. And so some people argue that his, his emphasis on kinds and, and um, what is it, categorical conversion is not a negation, but it's a it's an alternative to, to articulating the thesis, antithesis, synthesis model of dialectics. I disagree because I think that part of what he's getting at when he talks about evolution being nonlinear um, is that the way that dialectic that dialectics operates is through a, a correlation of forces that don't unfold in a linear fashion. They unfold in a leap to a, a new synthesis, so to speak. I know that's a lot of jargon, sorry, but the moral of the story of chapter one is dialectical materialism, period. <laughs> no, and I think um, I told you one of my takeaways from that, from, from even this sort of his preoccupation with understanding the primacy of matter and the way that things change is also in a very, in its very sort of basic essence, it's, it's a way out of a type of nihilism, right? So like, I think for him, it's reading to be able to say, because, because of the way these forces um, impact one another and have the potential to create new realities that this shit ain't lost to us. Like just because things are the way they are at the moment, and even if they seem hopeless and, um, and that something that we can't work our way out of, that if, if we have a basic understanding of the material world and the way progress, progress happens and occurs, right, and, and in a nonlinear fashion, we know that, that again, this is in essence the struggle continues, right? And so for me, that is, um, a, I think, a very important way to kind of congeal um, why for him um, materialism and dialectics in particular um, form the sort of basis. And then I think just, and this is just an aside, and I mentioned this to you before CBS, um, anybody who watches our conversations knows that I have a, a more um, obvious sort of feminist leaning, but one of the things that I've always appreciated about CBS is pushing that obviously there are certain um, epistemological uh, forms that don't exclusively belong to the realm of feminism. And one of the things that for this, that I found useful in this particular conversation was his articulation about this sort of non-linear understanding of time and progress, right? And that's something that I think, um, and, and a number of Western feminists, or the, the number of feminists in general like to think about the way that, um, when we think about the experiences of women, we think about time is conceived differently, but I appreciate it being able to read that through his own understanding of dialectics and materialism. Um, the last thing I'll add from this chapter, the very last line of this chapter is, our universe is a natural universe and its basis is a matter with its objective laws. And so the upshot to that is you can think whatever you want. You can perceive the world in whatever way you want, but there are laws through which sort of history and, and nature unfolds. And that is the basis of how we actually um, need to understand the world, right? And so it's, again, it's a, it's a critique of idealism and the way that um, the, the, the close relationship he sees between idealism um, and a type of individualism that tends toward oligarchy. So that is later on, but this is, this is sort of laying the foundation to make that argument. All right, so I'm gonna move on to chapter two, which is philosophy and society. Um, and so in this, again, um, I think Nkrumah's sort of main goal is to, is for people to understand that whether we're aware of it or not, a, 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 a philosophy um, is guiding an ideology, which is always at play. And so in order to undo whatever one is already existing, we have to have a sense of what it is that we want to put into place. And that has to be determined based on our, our specific goals, right? Um, so uh, at the end of page 33, um, 
says, um, but the interaction between the, uh, the alteration of social circumstances and the content of consciousness is not one-sided for circumstances can be changed by revolution and revolutions are brought about by men, by men who think as men of action and, and act as men of thought. It is true that revolutionaries are produced by historical circumstances. At the same time, they are not chafed before the wind of change, but have a solid ideological base. Oh, sorry, basis. Revolution has two aspects. Revolution is a revolution against an old order, and it is also a contest for a new order. The Marxist emphasis on the determining force of the material circumstances of life is correct, but I would also like to give great emphasis to the, to the determining power of ideology. A revolutionary ideology is not merely negative. It is not a mere conceptual refutation of a dying social order, but a positive creative theory, the guiding light of the emerging social order. This is confirmed by the letter from Engels um, quoted on the model page of the book. Um, and so what I again take from this is that in, I think in, in, I think in some ways the project, and we'll talk about this more, I think in some ways the project of consciencism as a fully fleshed out philosophy and or ideology is somewhat incomplete, but I don't take that to necessarily be an issue. I take that for the way that I read it is, is Nkrumah sort of making a call to those of us concerned with the liberation, with, with the liberation and unification of African people to take this up, right? And so he's doing it from from his own perspective, from his own material reality, but that there is an understanding that a revolutionary idea, that, that in order for society to change the sort of, the ideological basis must be revolutionary and has to look a particular way. And so I see the work of consciencism as his attempt um, to be, it's, it, I see it as in a sort of gestational stage. I see it as him attempting to create that and understand where it needs to come from. And that he's also, and he's also sort of setting clear parameters that while we engage other thinkers, that we also must think about what it means to develop this from our particular circumstances. I think that another, he has another important note in this chapter about um, prolegomena. <laughs> And this is basically the assertion of like a perfect system through which philosophy must operate. And he is eschewing this because he's saying that is not how dialectics work and that's not how society works. And so this on page 47, he writes, the motive lying behind um, prolegomena is a natural one. In certain circumstances, it is even commendable. It is an attempt to make sure that one's philosophical insight shall be conserved, an attempt to persuade the world that all the spade work of philosophy has been done, that all there is that all there is left to do is to build upon this final foundation. It is a claim to perfection. And so part of, but his, his entire, like, so con, um, conscientism as a philosophical framework is pushing back against this sort of closed idea of philosophy, right? That it's like, it's not enough to just build on what has already been done, not least because of the unique sort of historical and material circumstances of, of Africa, but also because the dialectics is fundamentally about change, that the, the imposition of um, this idea of perfection asserts like an end of history and asserts um, the sort of, um, an end point to change, which again is anti-dialectical. And so that's I, that's another sort of important foundation of his philosophical intervention. And I just wanna wrap oh, this chapter just with the way that he concludes the chapter, um, which you don't have to say much about that, I just wanted to. So, but, but however desiccated the new passions of some Western philosophers are, they can admittedly claim to share a continuity with the European cultural history. A non-Western student of philosophy has no excuse except a pedutic one for studying Western philosophy in the same spirit. He lacks even the minimal excuse of belonging to a cultural history in which the philosophies figure. It is my opinion that when we study philosophy, which is not ours, we must see it in the context of the intellectual history to which it belongs, and we must see it in the context of the milieu in which it was born. That way we can use it in the, fur in the furtherance of cultural development and the strengthening of our human society. Um, and and this, again, this is something that um, he states in the beginning and that he's very clear about um, that the work of philosophy is not, is not, you know, obviously his, his, his pushback against idealism is that this stuff is just not in the mind, that this, that, that, that it has a real 
um, impact and implication for how we live and experience the world, and that we that all of our political, um, moral, ethical concerns are grounded in these things, and that that's how we must treat them. Precisely. So, um, chapter three is society and ideology, and there's two main points I that I would draw from this. One is he lays out the relationship between philosophy and ideology. And the second is that he explains the, the, feet, the tripartite feature of African society. So first, in terms of philosophy, he says, philosophy as it relates to ideology, he says, philosophy, philosophy implies something of the nature of ideology. In the case where philosophy confirms a social milieu, it implies something of the ideology of that society. In the case in which philosophy opposes a social milieu, it implies something of the ideology of a, re of a revolution against that social milieu. Philosophy in its social aspect can therefore be regarded as pointing up an ideology. So in other words, philosophy is the reflection of, of an ideology, either an ideology that is meant to sustain the status quo or um, an ideology that is revolutionary in terms of setting out a different set of ethics and organization of, of society. Um, so he goes on to say that um, philosophy admits to being an instrument of ideology. So ideology is, primary philosophy is sort of a tool or a function of, of ideology. And then um, he also says that um, on page 59, an ideology, even when it is revolutionary, does not merely express the wish that a present social order should be abolished. It seeks to also defend and maintain the new social order which it introduces. While, while it is defending its own social order, it is still an ideology and the same. Um, that is to say, an ideology can remain an ideology while defending an existing progressive society, nor can the fact that some particular ideology is not explicit on paper prevent it from being one. What is crucial is not paper, but, but thought. And so here again, I think that he's, he's challenging this uh, sort of Western notion of like the written word as such, right? That if something is not written out and fully formed, that it doesn't constitute an ideology, that part of the entanglement of ideology and practice is that it is, it is a thought that propels action. It is the, the sort of comprehensive thought that propels action such that it does not have to necessarily be codified in text for it to be an ideology. The importance of, of ideology, I think, is we see this right now happening with this Ukraine situation. If you do not have an ideological framework, you will fall for many things, right? If you believe, if you do not, if you are operating from an ideology where it's like the West and the rest, well, where war is a um, viable means of international relations and where any defense of capitalism is viable, then, and we'll get more, we'll get into this more when we talk about the how a change in rules does not is not a change in ideology or the ethical system. But let me just say that, but but yeah, so ideology is important because it will structure the way that you struggle. It will, it will structure the content of that struggle, but also not only your critique of society, but the, the way you understand the society that you're moving toward. And so this claim of objectivity, right? This claim of, or this claim of, of being sort of anti-ideological is problematic because for Nkrumah, ideology, ideology is a catalyst in and of itself of struggle, right? Ideology is a way of situating, advancing, and continuing struggle. Um, and so the second, the second sort of takeaway from this chapter is where he talks about the three feature, the tripartite aspects of African society. So he says on page 68 that um, African society has um, one segment which comprises our traditional way of life. It has a second segment which is filled by the presence of the Islamic tradition in Africa. It has a final segment which represents the infiltration of the Christian tradition and culture of Western Europe into Africa using colonialism and neocolonialism as its primary vehicles. Um, these different segments are animated by competing ideologies, but since society implies a certain dynamic unity, there needs to emerge an ideology which genuinely catering for um, the needs of all will take the place of the competing ideology and so reflect the dynamic unity of society and be the guide to society's continual progress. So essentially, the other thing that he's arguing is that um, 
conscientism needs to incorporate or needs to be able to accommodate all three aspects of these societies. Granted, nowhere in this text do we get an understanding of, of the content of the Islamic influence of society. So we get a lot about the West. We get some about the sort of traditional African, but we don't know much about um, what that sort of Islamic content is of, of African society. But his overall point is that if we're being materialist and not idealist, we have to accommodate all three because that is that is the, the material reality. And through a synthesis, through through uh, and and um, insofar as um, conscientism is a synthesis of all three, then it brings these into a sort of philosophical whole, as opposed to encouraging sort of conflicts between them. Yeah, and I think to your point about it not existing in the text. So I mean, again, this is this is partially for me why I arrive at my conclusion of the sort of unfinished nature of consciencism, um, at least in the text as it stands, um, is because obviously we know that when Nkrumah was overthrown, he goes to Guinea and he's co-president um, of Guinea with Sekou Touré. Uh, obviously, in because we see even through the speech that Cabral gives, there are these relationships with, with uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, Guinea and Cape Verde. Um, what I see uh, in, in Chroma's maybe inability to address the specific nature of the sort of Islamic tradition is, is to account for what he is seeing, particularly in the case of West Africa, where there are so many um, Islamic states. And that there is, a, and that, that, that because of the nature of colonialism be, and because of what he already argues in the beginning because he makes this argument about the primacy of, of, of matter um, but not the soul so the sort of soul reality of matter and he makes an argument about the essence of the spirit for African peoples that I think that that's one of his um, overarching struggles and I wonder and I wonder really if this is more um, a struggle for him for, for his own ideology or if this is a struggle for him as a statesman right so as a statesman knowing that he is govern is having to be responsible for governing people who have very strong religious beliefs what does it then mean to to attempt to impose an ideology which takes that away from its people um and so for him in the context of ghana right christianity is that and then whatever forms of um traditional African spiritual practices, but obviously in, in Guinea, the state doesn't necessarily move away from an Islamic state, right? And so there are some differences, I think, even of forms of governance between Nkrumah and Ture. Um, but I think, again, that that is a call to, for all of us in our respective instances to think about what that means in our respective, um, in our respective realities. Yeah, and I, I mean, I also think it's not just about like the spiritual content, but like how it is that these different societies organi are organized, right? That there's a particular organization for him, the organization of traditional African society is communalist, right? And so it's, it's the, it's socialism in a pre-capitalist form. And so his understanding of socialism and communism is African communalism updated to its modern form. Whereas Western Christian heteropatriarchal capitalist society is fundamentally hierarchical and exploitative. We don't get a sense of how, in his conception, what is the organization of society under Islam? Like, what does it actually look like? And so that is sort of what's, what's, um, what's missing, right? And like what and that's important because that is going to dictate what that synthesis looks like, right? Not only philosophically, but also in terms of how one understands how, um, how to move toward a socialist society. There's more to be said about his particular conception of capitalism and the transition to socialism, but um, I think that will come up in our sort of next set of discussions. So um, go ahead. And so the, the way the book is largely organized is that um, even what Nkrumah really offers as consciencism comes in chapter four, right? The, the chapter that is entitled consciencism. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me from this um, particular chapter, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna start. I'm actually gonna start with this. It's a longer um, pull out. So he starts um, the chapter by saying, practice without thought is blind, thought without practice is empty. The three segments of African society, which I specified in the last chapter, the traditional, the Western, and the Islamic coexist uneasily. 
The principles animating them are often in conflict with one another. I have an illustration tried to show how the principles which inform capitalism are in conflict with the socialist egalitarianism of the traditional African society. He asked the question then, what then is to be done? And for him, I think this is the answer to, this is part and parcel of the answer to what is to be done, which is the development of this ideology that's rooted in our material um, realities. Um, I have stressed that the two other segments in order to be rightly seen must be accommodated only as, exper only as experiences of the traditional African society. If we fail to do this, our society will be wracked by the most malignant schizophrenia. Our attitude to the Western and the Islamic experience must be purposeful. It must also be guided by thought for practice without thought is blind. What is called for as a first step is a body of connected thought which will determine the general nature of our action in unifying the society which we have inherited. This unification to take, to take account at all times of the elevated ideals underlying the traditional African society. Social revolution must therefore have standing firmly behind it an intellectual revolution, a revolution in which our thinking and philosophy are directed towards the redemption of our society. Our philosophy must find its weapons in the environment and living conditions of the African people. It is from these, those conditions that the intellectual content of our philosophy must be created. The emancipation of the African continent is the emancipation of man. This requires two, two aims. First, the restitution of the egalitarianism of human society. And second, the lo logistic mobilization of all of our resources toward the attainment of that restitution. The philosophy that must stand behind this social revolution is that which I have once referred to as philosophical consciencism. Consciencism is the map in intellectual terms of the disposition of forces which will enable African society to digest the Western and the Islamic and the Euro-Christian elements in Africa and develop them in a way that they fit the African personality. And the African personality is itself defined by the cluster of humanist principles which underline the traditional African society. Philosophical consciencism is that philo philosophical standpoint which taking its start from the present con content of the African conscience indicates the way in which progress is forged out of the conflict in that conscience. Um, and again, I think this is, I think what I read in a lot of this is his attempt uh, is what, what would you call it? In some ways, there are very sort of elements of it, and I think that he is making us understand what it is that we need to be looking for as we formulate our ideology, right? Um, and he's already calling this philosophical consciencism, and I think that that is, you know, be because of his other work to theorize what an African personality is, and also for his so his for his sort of basic understanding that the material reality of, of people on the African continent is directly linked to the material reality of all peoples of African descent, wherever they are in the world. That again, even if, even for those of us who have never been to Africa, who weren't born there, that Africa must be primary because, the, because, of, the, because of that sense of linked fate, right? And that we have to have a sort of political, ideological, philosophical understanding of what, of what, material conditions have been inherited and where we want to go as a people. Um, so it's important to note that, you know, Nkrumah, I, I was trying to find where he directly explains this, but Nkrumah believes in a one party state. And that is because he, the way that he conceives of struggle through, is through sort of positive action and a mass party. And to have a mass party, you need to have one party, right? Um, and it's interesting, right? And so this needs to be, you know, and so there's all of, so basically what he's saying is that it's, it's really a challenge to this idea of, of liberal democracy or um, what is it, parliamentarian? Um, what is that? West, like a West, not Westphalian, but um, yeah, <laughs> parliament. Mm -hmm. Did you find it? It's on page 100. I didn't know if you were um, looking for it. Yeah, parliamentary democracy. So it, it's in a, a previous chapter that he talks about it as well. But basically, um, this is why, so so side note, this is why when Nayere says that the U.S. is a one-party state, but in typical sort of American um, excess, it claims to have two parties. Basically, they have the same. Like, it's the same sort of idea, although... U.S. is for capitalists in domination, 
before Nkrumah, what he's saying is that democracy need not be understood through political competition. Like that is not that is not the essence of, of democracy, so to speak, right? And so I, I think that's really important. And he gets a lot of critique because of that. And this is why people, you know, call him authoritarian and sort of say that this idea of a one party state was the basis for his overthrow and all this other things. But I think that what that is negating is how he gets to this idea, right? What the sort of philosophical foundations of the idea of a one party state is. And so um, that's another important aspect of, of how he's seeing the sort of actually, like actually existing um, conscientism. So on page 100, um, he says, in order to forestall this, it is necessary for positive action to be backed by a mass party and qualitatively to improve this mass so that by education and increase in its degree of consciousness, its aptitude for positive action becomes heightened. We can therefore say that in the colonial territory, positive action must be backed by a party, complete with its instruments of education. This is why the Convention People's Party of Ghana uh, developed from an early stages education wing, workers wing, farmers wing, youth wing, women's wing, etc. In this way, the people received constant political education. Their self-awareness was increased and such, and such a self-image was formed as ruthlessly excluded colonialism in all its guises. It is also in the backing of millions of members of supporters united by a common radical purpose, the revolutionary character of the Convention People's Party consists and not merely in the piquancy um, of its programs. Its mass and national support made it possible to think in realistic terms of instituting changes of fundamental nature and in a social hodgepodge bequeathed by colonialism. A people's parliamentary democracy with a one-party system is better able to express and satisfy the common aspirations of a nation as a whole than a multiple party parliamentary system, which is in fact only a ruse for perpetuating and for perpetuating and covers up the inherent struggle between the haves and the have-nots. Yes, and so that dovetails back to his critique of neo-colonialism that in a multi-party situation or the way like the party the party system as a way of sort of capturing segments within society allows for creeping <laughs> creeping neo-colonialism so to speak right it allows for the machination like so for neo-colonial interests to be more to be sort of reinscribed in society and so for his um again so for his containment or, or excuse me, for his for his position, the one party state is a way to sort of hold that re-inscription of neocolonialism at bay. Um, <laughs> you all have, may, may have seen, heard me say, I, I don't believe in democracy. This is what I mean, right? Democracy in a particular type of specification. So anyway, um, on to the last chapter. So chapter five is the chapter that I'm sure people look at and are like, Ah, oh, nah, right? So for example, it looks a lot like this. But the importance of the of this chapter is it goes back to when he talks about matter is that the the way the relationship between quantity and quality, right? That all quality is at base quantity. And so essentially what he's saying is that the appearance of struggle can be understood in these sort of very mathematical terms. Um, and so that this is why he sets out all of these theorems. But essentially what he's, there's a number of, of, of things that he's calculating, but primarily he is looking at the relationship between positive and negative action, socialism, materialism, and um, conscientism, liberated ter the, the relationship between liter liberated territory, unity, and defense against neocolonialism, as well as um, the material underpinnings of a philosophy laid out in chapter four. And so he understands part of what he's, he is also conveying with um, these sort of mathematical theorems is that ultimately unity amongst liber um, liberated territories is absolutely instrumental for defending positive action or for, for defending the sort of relate the relationship between positive action and negative action with negative action approaching zero, but it will never be zero. So this is what he's saying. You will never get rid of colonialism, imperialism as such, but the goal is the proportion, right? The goal is to have 
that carrot thing, the greater than toward positive action, not toward negative action. But colonialism is a situation where the carrot is toward negative action, not positive action, the greater than or equal to sign, whatever y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is basically, that. that is one of the sort of fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental sort of takeaways from this. He also says, so he has different um, symbols for conscientism, materialism, and, and dialectical struggle. He says this is a redundancy right? But that for the purposes of consciousness raising, he separates them out because con um, conscientism is fundamentally rooted in materialism and dialectical materialism and struggle. Um, so the upshot of, of all of this, right, on page 115, he says, in order that socialism should be applicable in a country, the country must be liberated, it must enjoy unity, it must embrace philosophical materialism, it must have a specific philosophical con um, conscientism holding its general nature in common, but expressing its individuality through the actual material conditions of the territory, territory for which it is formulated and um, through the experience and consciousness of the people of that territory. It must apply suitable and adequate dialectical moments expressed through positive action, wielded through a mass party. That is what, so that's what, all that, that's what it means, right? And so, and he's showing, and, and again, he's doing this to show that this is not just arbitrary. This is not just his sort of, philosophical musings about this thing that this can actually be that this is an actual sort of this idea of struggle has a material basis and it can be sort of calculated out right um, and that it's always a correlation of forces which is why again he says that it's never that negative action i.e colonialism and imperialism are never going to be zero right that that's just not it's not going to happen but again the point is to hold it at bay through the, the correlation of the things that I, I just read in that paragraph. So um, yeah, and then, so th that's the sort of, those are the sort of main takeaways of that chapter. So don't be scared. Don't be scared of, of the theorems. There's a, he has, you know, he has a whole guide. So all you have, if you just plug in what they actually correlate to and turn the sort of theorem into a word problem, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but it can be quite intimidating, especially, you know, for those of us, there's a sort of racialized and gender component to math, like those of us who are sort of pushed out of math, it can be intimidating, but um, it's important. So that's chapter five. So at this point, um, so technically the seminar or the, the seminar as it was constructed is supposed to be about 90 minutes. Um, so we took a little bit longer to go through the text than we had anticipated, but there were some questions that we for ourselves to think through, but we also wanted to give people an opportunity um, to engage with us um, in the remaining time that we have in the seminar. And so what I can do um, is just invite you all again to drop questions or comments if you wanna be in conversation, and then we can kind of keep talking. Um, through some of the questions that we came up with for ourselves. Um, and yeah, so I'll yeah, also drop those questions in the chat. Yeah, sorry, I'll also yeah. drop those questions in the chat that we're gonna kind of be talking to, um, talking about, and then folks can kind of weigh in. Um, yeah. So we're just gonna combine the sort of Q&A period and the in these last sort of 12 minutes that we have, we'll combine the Q&A and the, the work, kind of our, our work study period. Um, and, go ahead. Okay, so the first, I mean, this came up through, as we were discussing the text, the first question, or not the first question, one of the questions we decided to focus on was, how does philosophy and our ideology inform how capitalism is understood? And maybe CBS, you want to speak more to this because you had specific um, critiques of the way capitalism doesn't show up uh, in the text. <clears throat> so here's the thing about Nkrumah, okay? Nkrumah has essentially a, a similar understanding about capitalism and feudalism as Cedric Robinson. So basically what, he's, what he essentially argues is that capitalism is basically refined feudalism, which is basically refined slave society, that there's actually no rupture, that these are just continuities, which leads him to say that um, 
socialism does not contain the fundamental ingredient of capitalism or the principle of exploitation. But this is sort of a negation of the, the classical Marxist understanding of how of, of class struggle and how history has unfolded, right? That each stage in, in sort of economic development is a rupture from the previous epoch because the rising class has overthrown the previous ruling class. This is not what he believes. So basically he says, capitalism is a, de a development by refinement from feudalism, just as feudalism is a development by refinement from slavery. The essence in, in this, okay, so the essence of reform is to combine a continuity of fundamental principle with a tactical change in the manner of expression of the fundamental principle. Reform is not a change in, in the thought, but one in its manner of expression, not a change in what is said, but one in idiom. In capitalism, feudalism suffers or rather enjoys reform, and the fundamental principle of feudalism merely strikes new levels of subtlety. In slavery, it is thought that exploitation, um, the alienation of the fruits of labor of others, requires a certain degree of political and forcible subjection. In feudalism, it is thought that a lesser degree of the same kind of subjection is adequate to the same purpose. In capitalism, it is thought that a still lesser degree is adequate. In this way, um, psychological irritants to revolution are appeased and exploitation finds a new lease of life until the people should discover the opposition between reform and revolution. So the other upshot to this is that um, he's saying that the antecedent to socialism is not capitalism. So on 73, he says, if one seeks the social political ancestor of socialism, one must go to communalism. Socialism has characteristics in common with communalism, just as capitalism is linked with feudalism and slavery. This just presents a particular issue about dialectical materialism, or it, it present, it's sort of like um, Eric Williams. So Eric Williams is a dialectical materialist who is not a Marxist. In the same way, this, this rendering of capitalism not being a break from feudalism and feudalism not being a break from slavery, but rather a refinement or a reform of it, I think presents particular um, questions, right? It, it, it's, it's not Marxist, which is fine, but, I, but, I, but it also sort of, um, it's, as a, as a Rodius, it's a little bit problematic for me, but it also, but again, but it's very, it's very much consonant with Robinson, although for Robinson, the through line that connects these things and, and negates rupture is racialism. For Nkrumah, it's the continuity of exploitation. So uh, that is, <laughs> I don't really know what that means for how we understand capitalism. Um, but I think that what it, it does open up is the compatibility with sort of African society and African tradition with socialism or communism, that it's not just some, some European or white shit, but rather it is something that's fundamentally compatible with the traditions of African society. Now, the way that capitalism has um, functioned within African society. I think there's a little bit of a punt on the part of Nkrumah. He does talk about imperialism, but I think that there's a little bit of a gap in that analysis of capitalism and socialism. So, that, The last thing you said just took me to a different place, but I was trying to think about how I wanted to respond to the first. Um, so to your point about what it means to to position socialism as something that is not because one of the things that he says is that capitalism or and that, that all these these are alien these are these are aliens um to the sort of African material circumstances, right? Um, and that there is already a precedent set for how we engage in a society where we are thinking about the, the, common, the common good of people. Um, and so in order to be able, and so and I think also what's important there too is, is that when he responds earlier in the text to this notion that we, are a people without history who have not made significant contributions to understanding how people organize themselves or how society organizes themselves that there that it already exists in 
in our history. And that that's something that we need to be able to see those links and continuities between. And so, I mean, I don't know. I, for me, I think that that's what's primarily at stake there is, is, is like the point that you made, um, that working towards a system of scientific socialism is, is in fact not alien. And so that, and that even, and where a Marxist rendering um, feels alien be, in, one, in one particular regard because of the way that it does not necessarily, because, because, of its, because of its purported atheism, that there is room to move towards what, in, what we understand or what Akuma understands as socialism and or scientific socialism without necessarily making the atheist turn. And that that is, again, one of his ways of accounting for the historical material reality of African peoples. Um, there's a question in here about primary, um, where did it go? It was something in here about primary. Please touch on the primary, yeah. uh, the questions of the primary reality of matter versus the sole reality of matter. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> it's funny we're talking about this. Essentially what Nkrumah, so Nkrumah is eschewing a sort of economic reductionism, right? Or a sort of materialist reductionism that while matter is primary, while, so matter is not the only thing, but the sort of the appearance or the, the sort of our perception is reducible to materialism, but both exist. So he says that, um, if the sole existence of matter is asserted, then space and time, this is on page 88, then space and time, insofar as they do, they are not matter, must be unreal. Philosophical um, conscientism does not assert the sole reality of matter, rather it asserts the primary reality of matter. So what he's saying is that in order for matter to be the sort of way we ought to, or philosophical materialism to be the way we ought to understand the world, it doesn't mean we have to negate the existence of, let us say, idealism, um, or of, of appearance or perception, but rather um, one it, that materialism is primary. It's similar to, so Claudia Jones in, in her piece, um, and into the neglect of the problems of the Negro woman, even as she's talking about triple oppression, what she says is that when it comes to the US situation or when it comes to the situation of US blacks or black women in the United States, the Negro question is primary. It doesn't mean that the woman question doesn't exist. It means that the Negro question is primary, that that sort of race is the sort of the structuring sort of architecture for how those other forms of oppression are experienced. And I think that likewise, or that that was what was brought to mind when I read that matter is primary, but it's not the sole reality. It's not the sole existence. And both need, and that needs to be sort of understood, right? And again, this goes back to like what Layla was saying about his unwillingness to abandon like spirituality or abandon um, the idea, like the the soul, right? It's to to re inhabit the soul within the context of a of a materialist reality. Okay, so we have how do we do this? Um, so there's also super interesting about the gap in analysis on uh, capitalism, given his ideas of neocolonialism, one would think it's implicit there. I mean, I do think it's implicit there, but I think CBS, what you're referring to is, it is a lack of an explicit conversation around how capitalism operates in the African context. That's, that's what you're feeling. Hmm? Is <laughs> I was saying that I was responding to the uh, question. Give, uh, super interesting about the gap in analysis on capitalism, given his ideas of neocolonialism, one would think it's implicit there. And I think there, 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 there is an Im implicit conversation about, oh, sorry, yeah, implicit conversation is happening about capitalism, but you're basically saying that to your liking, there's not enough of a clear laying out of how of the way that it operates in the African context. Exactly. So the problem, so this goes back to Rodney's critique that at, at this, when he's writing um, conscientism, he still seems to be sort of sidestepping the reality of class structure within the African context. And so he turns to imperialism and neocolonialism, which is the high, so neocolonialism is the highest stage of imperialism. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, but in not sort of 
naming the endogenous ways that capitalism operates other than the sort of the boot, the petty bourgeoisie or the comprador class, there's a way that capitalism um, is sidestepped. It is implied in neo-colonialism, but that is a relationship sort of among nations. So we don't see how it's operating, I would say, in on like on the continent, like as such. Um, and I think, oh, sorry. No, he's just more explicit later on. In class struggle in Africa, that's precisely what the point is, right? And so I just think at the at the point of conscientism, that is underdeveloped in my perspective. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. I just I also think that it's it is a it is a product of what of how classes were collapsed, I think, under the colonial predicament. And then and then as you know, the comprador classes, the the what do you call it, the, the military classes that that then form as a result of um neo-colonialism and, and uh, later forms of, of colonial uh rule mm -hmm. that don't look as then look as clear then it then i think you begin to see how those class divisions flesh out and that and that is the work that he attempts to do in i think in class struggle in africa how do we want to proceed <laughs> so somebody wanted us to answer our crucial questions on combating reformism and what is to be done um there we go so i guess we could spend maybe 10 minutes speaking about that and then maybe uh -huh. wrap up. So in terms of combating reformism, part of what Nkrumah, it seems to me, is arguing is that, so he has this whole, we didn't go in depth into it, but he has this whole sort of exegesis about ethics, principle, and rules. And that a change in rules is not a fundamental change in principle or in ethics. And that is what abets reformism. So to combat reformism, we have to take a totalizing approach to struggle and to our critique and our understanding of society. So putting a few chips in the cookie, right? So representation ain't it, right? Um, social democracy or a more benevolent capitalism isn't it because it just well, reinscribes the Welfareism system. is not it. Yeah. Welfareism is not it, right? And so I think that to combat reformism is to really be clear about the fundamental antagonism between socialism and capitalism. These things are not compatible, right? And the problem is there's a particular distortion in our society where anything other than anything that is for the people is said to be socialist. So any idea that is not like go and die is said to be socialist, right? And this is this is the this is the sort of um, obfuscation of what the actual conditions are. And so, reformism is a change to the rules without a change to the actual ethical system rooted in an in in an ideology of liberation, right? So. We have ideology of liberation. We have to have a struggle for for total liberation, and that that's not to say that there aren't gains to be made along the way to sort of keep suffering, to to stop the bleeding, so to speak. But off too often the sort of me, the means become the end, and I think that that's how we keep on getting caught in the trap of like reformism. Yeah, I mean, because I think his primary, I think the primary thing that he says about this is that. Yes, of course, because of technological advancement, because because of the nature, because of the dialectical nature of history and movement, that yes, of course, we can see observable um, improvements in certain elements of the quality of life, but that 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 cannot be misinterpreted as revolutionary change, and that that form that that we always have to be critically aware of what reform does and how it numbs us really to what the the essential change needs to be. Um, I'm just I was just this is from I think a little bit later in that same passage that uh, CBS was reading from earlier um, on page 72 in this way capitalism continues with its characteristic pompous plans for niggerly reforms. While it coerces one section of a society somehow into making itself available to another section, which battens on it. The development which capitalism marks over slavery and feudalism consists as much in the methods by the means of which our labor is coerced as the mode as in the mode of production. 
Capitalism is but the gentleman's method of slavery. Indeed, a standard rules of capitalism today is to imitate some of the proposals of socialism and turn this imitation to its own use. Running with the hare and hunting with the hounds is more than a pastime to capitalism. It is the hub of a, of a complete strategy. In socialism, we seek an increase in levels of production in order solely that the people by whose exertions production is possible shall raise their standing of standard of living and attain a new consciousness and level of life. Capitalism does this too, but not for the same purpose. Increased productivity under capitalism does not lead to a rise in the standard of living, but but when the proportion of distribution of value between exploiter, exploited and exploiter is kept constant, then any increase in level of production must mean a greater quantity, but not proportion of value accruing to the exploited. Capitalism thus discovers a new way of seeming to implement reform while really genuinely avoiding it i.e. it creates the welfare state. And this is also why we get ignorant ass comments like, well, at least we live in the United States, right? A, a part of the reason why the, the, the standard of living exists as it does in the United States is precisely because of the ways um, this form of exploitation is taking place in other places. In, in other places. So we have to constantly be aware of all of the levels um, in which this type of reform is engaged in order to make capitalism anew and, and keep it viable. Something else that Nkrumah writes about is how ideal, like idealism, right? Idealist philosophy tends toward like oligarchy. And that's important in this, this is kind of apropos of nothing, but that's important in this conversation, this current sort of situation, this Ukraine situation and the way that Russia is said to have like oligarchs but the US has billionaires. It's the same shit. All of this is, is in an idealist sort of, is rooted in a sort of idealist individualism. Um, because part of, you know, else, you know, part of Nkrumah's analysis of idealist versus materialist philosophy is that idealism tends toward um, individualism and, you know, and it's, it's rooted, there's a sort of individualist that, individualism that it pervades um, idealist, philosophy, not least through solipsism and quasi-solipsism, et cetera, right? And so, again, when we don't understand, when we don't have dialectical materialism, when we don't understand what the objective conditions are, you can argue one thing about one place and completely miss that this is precisely what is happening here. And reform helps with that obfuscation, right? Um, then that lends to the question of like, what is to be done? Revolution, right? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like, you know, we you know, organize, <laughs> organize, right? Our, our old calls for political education, which is what we're doing with um, conscientism. You don't have to agree with everything in a given text to study it and study collectively and to take, I, take these ideas seriously as a call to action, join a revolutionary organization, organize, um period that's it and you know the question of reform so so there's this idea that there's nothing too good for the working class and it is true so whatever reforms sort of mitigate our suffering are welcome and are warranted but again those reforms have nothing to do with liberation save for making our conditions of struggle less onerous, maybe. Um, but, you know, what is to be done is we got to, you know, keep going. <laughs> we have to keep struggling, period. It continues until... The struggle always continues, but but I do think that that, that important point that you made about reform, <laughs> I mean, because I think there there's a difference between... Um, not being for anything that alleviates some some degree of the suffering that we experience as people, but also being aware of how that alleviation of suffering then perpetuate various systems under which or through which we are exploited, right? And I and I think that um, with this sort of understanding of dialectics and contradiction, we can hold both of those to be true, right? We can hold that as human beings, we deserve not to sort of live, you know, with, with a foot on our neck all the time, and also be aware of the fact that 
certain pressure release valves don't actually do the good that we hope them to do in the long run. Jerry, the answer to everything is socialism, okay? You cannot under overcome the alienation of labor in a capitalist system. You just, it's like, that's, that's, and that's the sort of, you, it can't be piecemeal. If revolution is to upend the very ways that we exist in society, that's what that means then. She so, said it, come for her. I did, I <laughs> Preferably did. Together. <laughs> Get her in Germany. <laughs> Of the brave, which have brought rain 